Welcome to Trading Nation. I'm Brian Sullivan. We're joined by David Rosenberg, Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef. David, you put out a piece today, Friday, in the, the Canadian paper, the Globe and Mail, saying things that you would not buy right now. You don't like most of the US stock market. You don't like most of corporate credit. Uh, you don't like a lot of real estate. What do you like then? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty narrow list, but uh, th there are some things that I do like. And uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, out of the, say, the North American sectors, uh, I like energy right now. It's about the only sector I could point to uh, that I could see has some visibility and some upside potential based on where the oil price is. Um, because uh, the oil stocks, the uh, exploration producers, uh, are not trading anywhere close to where WTI is right now. We've gravitated up to $53, $54 a barrel. Uh, I think it's going to go higher over the near term. And the last time the oil price was actually trading at these levels earlier this year, uh, the S&P 500 Energy Index uh, was 10% higher than it is right now. So uh, I can see uh, if you're going to add alpha here to the portfolio, keeping in mind that energy stocks are still down 10% for the year, the worst performing sector, I'd actually be taking profits uh, in a lot of the more growthy areas that are very expensive that have done well for you this year and start tiptoeing into the energy stocks uh, for the next several months. That's in terms of sectors. In terms of regions, uh, you know, the one part of the world that looks very good to me right now, uh, a great turnaround story that's under-owned uh, is Japan. Uh, and the mm -hmm. Nikkei is breaking out. In fact, you know, you look at the charts, I think even a child could see that a 30-year secular downtrend has been broken over the course of the past couple of months. Uh, it's one of the few markets that is not trading expensively to its historical price earnings ratio. Almost everybody else in the world is. And I think that there are some uh, solid macro fundamentals emerging there. And Abe winning that landslide majority uh, is, I think, going to give Japan two words that's going to give them more of a positive re-rating on their assets. These two words uh, where the rest of the world are, is bereft right now is called political stability. Uh, so I'm looking at Japan right now as a, as a story that has a lot more legs. Uh, you know, unlike the U.S., their economy is more mid-cycle than late cycle. So they have a greater runway for growth. I think greater political certainty there. And let's face it, uh, a friendlier central bank from a liquidity standpoint. Would you we just, know would that you, the BOJ is not going to do anything for a long period of time. Would you just buy the EWJ, which is the big uh, Nikkei 225 ETF, or would you actually buy individual Japanese equities? Well, you know, uh, we're active managers, so we're never going to buy, say, ETFs or indices. We'll go out and buy the, um, you know, buy the, buy the names that we like that uh, have a, a tailwind behind them. And there's a whole host of them, really. You know, when you're taking a look at domestic demand in Japan right now, it's interesting. Very bullish development is the female participation rate. Nobody talks about that. People just think of Japan myopically as this country with a declining population. Well, they're addressing that. They're importing foreign labor, but also they're incentivizing women to come into the labor force. Actually, you look at the labor force participation rate for women in Japan. This is a huge cultural shift. It looks like the female participation rate in the United States did during that whole proliferation of the two-income family back during that wonderful Reagan expansion of the 1980s. So I think that you could look into domestic demand plays, uh, you know, maybe focus on where do women shop uh, in, uh, in Japan, for example, because that's where the income and jobs are coming. Who, which is the country uh, across the ocean that is facilitating uh, the infrastructure boom underway in India? These are, these are Japanese industrials, large cap industrials. Uh, but what really I find encouraging is, of course, you know, we focus on the Nikkei, we focus on the topics. But what's interesting in Japan is that the small cap stocks uh, are starting to outperform the large cap stocks. And what that's telling me is that this is more than just, you know, buy Japan because of the weak yen. This is actually a much more fundamental story that a lot of people are missing. Japan is probably the most under-owned stock market on the planet uh, from a global portfolio manager perspective. And even the locals have more of their money in 0% yielding bank deposits than, than in equities. Yeah. But my sense is that an equity culture there is going to start developing. I actually think that, that the tailwind in Japan, notwithstanding you know, what, <laughs> what North Korea ends up doing or not doing, but uh, I, I'd say that from a fundamental and liquidity yeah. evaluation perspective, Japan is well worth a look. You can't avoid owning Japan or South Korea just because of North Korea. I mean, and what I mean by that is I'm not, I'm not being sort of trite about it. I'm just saying the reality is if something does bubble up, it's going to be such a big event that it won't matter what you own. It's probably going to go down in value, correct? I mean, you can't live in fear because that, that, that threat has existed for a long time. Right. Well, look, it's uh, Warren Buffett famously said uh, that if you mix your politics in with your investment decision making, 
uh, you're making a very big mistake. So uh, I would 100% uh, agree with what you just said, but you know, there's, there's something that's coming out of this. Uh, like for example, Abe wins this landslide election. What is he likely to do in the face of the North Korea threat? What is he gonna do now that uh, Z in China uh, has clearly um, uh, stated that they're gonna become more imperialistic, greater dominance in Southeast Asia, of course, that also means he's going to build uh, and buy a big ships perspective. and weapons, right? They're going to rearm for the first time since World War II. They've already well, begun, it, right? And so, change the constitution uh, is, um, is is one of the reasons why he called the snap election. And you know, everybody looks at Japan in the post World War II experience because that's when we've all lived as a pacifist nation. But those that are true historians know what Japan historically has really been like. But without getting into a warrior-like uh, you know a narrative here. I think what's important is that uh, you're going to find that these electronic companies that you own in Japan will all, all, all of a sudden in the next few years be re-rated as not just electronics but defense electronics, smart technology related to the military. And the multiplier impacts and the accretive impact on earnings is going to be huge. I mean, look what happened in the United States. Would, would Silicon Valley have existed without the Pentagon? I mean, all of the, uh, the technology, the advances, uh, the cutting edge has always come out of the military. And uh, that's been held back in Japan, but no longer. So that's going to give, uh, I think, an ongoing re-rating uh, to that part of the world. Where, by the way, you're taking a look at earnings revision momentum right now globally. Japan looks very, very solid right now. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. <laughs> David Rosenberg of Gluskin Chef. For some reason, I know a few Thanks. phrases. Gluskin Chef likes energy. Domo. <laughs> and likes Japan. David, we'll see you again soon. Take care. Take care. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.